they recognize we have this insatiable need for energy. Like we're not going backwards in our energy consumption. Yeah. So if we're going to have new energy generation, it has to be clean energy. Deliveries of fuel are a clear vulnerability. Natural gas obviously can hold an entire nation hostage. The typical construction timeline is really like six to 15 years on the big reactors right now. The really exciting thing for me is that at the really far end of the scale of portable micro reactors, we haven't really achieved that yet. You could actually produce these in a factory because they're portable. You could do mass production. Maybe nuclear energy is a lot safer than we actually originally realized. The radiation exposure from living next to a coal plant is higher than the radiation exposure from living next to a nuclear power plant. 10 or 15 years from now, the idea that we can't just immediately turn on a reliable and enduring power source for a community, that's gonna be unimaginable. It's like, it just, it will be a solved problem. What might surprise some people to learn is that nuclear energy accounts for 20% of the electricity in the United States. But what I think will surprise very few people is to learn that this carbon-free energy source has quite the storied history over the last few decades, resulting in new reactors slowing almost entirely to a halt. However, the past few years have been what some people might call a comeback story. In 2023, we saw America's first newly built reactor come online in over three decades. But we're also seeing startups build entirely new types of reactors, public discourse shifting, and even the US government itself recently announcing its intent to triple nuclear power production by 2050. So in today's episode, originally recorded in the heart of Washington DC back in January at A16Z's American Dynamism Summit, we talk about this truly unique moment in time for nuclear energy. A16Z general partner David Yulovich joins forces with Doug Bernauer, CEO of micro reactor company Radiant, and Dr. Catherine Huff, Assistant Secretary of the Office of Nuclear Energy, as they collectively discuss nuclear energy's role in our country's future. Because remember, energy is vital to many of the industries that we talk about here. Energy powers the data centers that run our clouds, the electric cars that drive on our streets, and of course, is fuel for the factories that build our future. So if anything feels certain, is that we're gonna need more energy, not less. So tune in here as this group of policymakers, founders, and funders discuss why increasing our nuclear capacity should be a national priority and what it'll take to reverse this multi-decade trend. Oh, and if you'd like to get an inside look into A16Z's American Dynamism Summit, you can watch several of the stage talks from the event, featuring policymakers like Congressman Jake Auchincloss or Senator Todd Young, and of course, both founders and funders building toward American Dynamism. You can find all of the above at a16z.com slash ADSummit. All right, let's get started. Nuclear has quite the storied history, and in the last 50 years in particular, progress has really slowed. And I'd love to get your take, Dr. Huff, what's your take on the key factors that you really attribute to that? The expense of different kinds of energy technology typically determine what utilities are going to select. And there was a serious period of time where, for example, natural gas was an extremely cheap option to build quickly with low capital investment. And that, I think, is the primary driver for a lot of reduction in the builds for nuclear. And then as you lose that muscle, it becomes more and more expensive to get it back, right? Much like if you stop mm -hmm. working out. Yeah, totally. And I think there's a lot of public opinion around nuclear. Some people attribute that to, again, that slowdown over the last few decades. Doug, is there anything you'd add there and maybe other misconceptions that you think the public holds? I think over the past 50 years, a lot has happened. You know, uh, solar and wind technology really came about and was deployed mm -hmm. kind of in the middle of this nuclear story we're telling. Um, and these, you know, forms of low cost energy, um, but that are not resilient forms of energy. And by the time we deployed them significantly to the grid, we started to look for uh, a source of power that you can scale, that you can throttle up and down on demand. Um, and at the same time, we scientists started to care about climate. And then I think the, the public really has come around to really care about climate and not just to care, but to want to do something about it. And so I think nuclear has this really cool uh, new role to fill um, instead of natural gas, which I agree with Dr. Huff, uh, the low cost of it definitely cause us to adopt that, to fill that need rather than nuclear. But I think uh, nuclear can leapfrog it. Yeah. And I think we are seeing renewed interest, which is exciting, especially over the last few years. David, what's your take on that? 
Is there a really strong why now? And is it just climate or is there another series of factors at play? I think that we have this insatiable thirst for energy and we have so many things that power the way we live and the way we want to live and the way we want to work that require electricity. Um, and so we need all forms of energy to be increased, I think. Um, some are better than others. Some have a longer future, I think, ahead of them than others. And so for me, nuclear is this base load energy. You don't need the wind to be blowing. You don't need the sun to be out. Um, and it can be delivered in a lot of form factors. Uh, and so to me, that makes it very exciting and worth a lot of really, really worth the investment in rebuilding the muscle, to, to use the analogy that Dr. Huff uh, made earlier, to really rebuild the muscle of how do we build nuclear power plants and what kind of plants do we want to build and to power what kind of loads and in what kind of circumstances. Um, and so I think that as people, I think climate's a huge part of it. People want, they recognize we have this insatiable need for energy. Like we're not going backwards in our energy consumption. Yeah. That, that ship has sailed. Um, so if we're going to have new energy uh, generation, it has to be clean energy. And I think that there's also been I think a renewed interest in re and people getting re-educated as to what are the risks and opportunities with nuclear energy. And I think that's come from a lot of different places, um, whether it's from government or from industry or from academia, that maybe nuclear energy is a lot safer than we actually originally realized. Right. Um, and that, that's really worth the, the time spent there to, to see if that's a viable way to generate the kind of energy that we need in the future. I mean, it's been a long time, right? We're, we're not in the same place as many decades ago. There are new reactor designs, which we will definitely get to. But Dr. Huff, I want to talk about your house testimony that you did recently. And you referred to our current approach to nuclear as, quote, a national security vulnerability. And you re reinforced that the Office of Nuclear Energy is doing a few things. So first, keeping the existing fleet of reactors operating and online, deploying new advanced reactor technologies, sustaining and securing the nuclear fuel cycle, and expanding nuclear energy cooperation. And something I'd love to get you to touch on is really that role of nuclear in America's global standing and security. Thanks for that. And I think it is that that why now question ties to this. Um, you know, in the testimony, the particular component of our approach that I think is an active vulnerability is the fuel cycle security. Mm -hmm. But energy security and energy resilience that nuclear energy can provide to support those more variable sources to be on no matter what day it is, what time it is, to, to not require refueling, consistent deliveries of fuel we've seen in, for example, uh, embattled Russia-Ukraine invasion. We've seen that deliveries of fuel are a clear vulnerability. Natural gas obviously can hold an entire nation hostage. If you can not dispatch that power, then it's not useful to your resilience. Nuclear power, on the other hand, even existing conventional plants, they only need to be refueled once every 18 months, maybe two years, right? And so, you know, they can, they can run alone as an island for quite a while. And this really underpins what we can see as an energy security and energy resilience that, that frankly, in today's geopolitical universe represents our access to sovereignty mm -hmm. as nations, our, you know, continued operation as, you know, independent states. You know, the U.S. has a number of other features that make it a secure nation. But there are a lot of other countries that really can be threatened by uh, another nation that would use energy as a weapon. Yeah. And we have many technologists building towards these new reactors and improving that fuel cycle. But can you speak specifically to the government's role in that? What is the government's role in securing that fuel cycle and that glo global cooperation while also ensuring that we're getting these new reactors built in the USA? Yeah, it's, it takes a lot of pieces, right, with tax credits from the Inflation Reduction Act and yeah. grant funding from the bipartisan infrastructure law. We're able to do things like encourage subsequent license renewals to be economic for existing nuclear power or in the case of, you know, the bipartisan infrastructure law dollars, advanced demonstration programs. But the Office of Nuclear Energy's focus has historically been on R&D programs, the kind of R&D that takes startups like Radiant and, you know, support 
technological advancements. And through small grants, we've tried to expand our support of as many companies as possible. And there are lots of them, more than we could possibly support, actually. And it's, I think, a feature of many decades of working through the national laboratories, which we manage and operate from the Department of Energy, um, and ensuring that we have a basis, a tech, strong technological capability to support the kinds of, you know, scientific explorations that we need to propel those technologies forward. So let's talk about some of those new technologies. Doug, let's throw it over to you. Can you actually just break down the different generations of reactors and also where we've come, right? As I said before, it's been several decades. Where are we now in that technology? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Huck to correct me on anything I get wrong here. <laughs> I'm actually not an expert in all the history of nuclear and every kind of reactor sure. that there is. I'm really an expert in what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, which is portable uh, high temperature gas reactor. But the generations roughly, um, you know, people use these gen one, two, three, and four terms. Uh, gen one are really the reactors we first figured out. They're kind of pre-enrichment. They're usually like a graphite moderated reactor. Um, and then generation two reactors were very different because we started to do enrichment with these bi uh, big gas diffusion enrichment plant. And in that time period, uh, the U.S. was really the four, at the forefront of everything. I think we had over 400 uranium mines operating in the U.S. Um, and really, uh, we were the great developers and exporters of our technology to the rest of the world. And then Gen 3 uh, really are meant to be uh, an advanced form of those Gen 2 reactors that can make use of enrichment. And they're like uh, accident-tolerant fuels um, or uh, ability to recycle fuel. They're kind of these advanced features. And then Gen 4 is really meant to represent these things that are much farther away. They're kind of future that you know, are like, you know, they perfectly produce hydrogen, let's say, and, and make a hydrogen economy possible. So you have like big reactors, right? Yes. They're a gigawatt, they're for a million people or a million homes, let's say. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. more than a million people. This is kind of the right scale. Um, and then we've got SMRs. And the purpose of SMRs is really to take that big reactor and build it really fast. Okay. And yeah. the typical construction timeline is really like six to 15 years on the big reactors right now, depending who makes them, even for the exact same reactor, like an AP1000 built in the US is very slow, built in Asia is very fast. Um, but you can make the reactor smaller and you can make it faster. The idea behind SMR is to you know, make something that's uh, maybe for about not a million homes, but maybe about 250,000 homes, right? A quarter of the size, but be able to build it really quickly. And if we could achieve that, it would be a great economic success. But the, the spectrum is getting longer and longer. I think one of the interesting things happening now are people are looking smaller and smaller and looking at micro reactors. And there's kind of two categories of micro reactors, um, portable and non-portable. And if you do a fully portable micro reactor, this is around the scale of like a thousand homes. So it's a thousand times smaller than the reactor all the way at the other end of the spectrum. Um, and you have micro reactors which are not portable, which are, you know, 10 or 20 times larger, maybe like 10 or 20 megawatt electric, something like that. Um, the really exciting thing for me is that at the really far end of the scale of portable micro reactors, we haven't really achieved that yet. And you could actually produce these in a factory because they're portable, you can do mass production um, and then ship them around and very quickly deploy them in all these little areas where you have, you know, a equivalent of a thousand homes, which could also be like, you know, a workplace that has 2,500 people, a mine, a military base, a hospital um, in some key kind of remote region. So I like this scale better than like thinking <laughs> about the advanced ones, more about like deployment and like right. how can you the use case put mm -hmm. them out yeah, in different areas. Maybe we can talk about the use case, right? So when we're talking about, let's say, a military base, what is the current state, right? If we're not using these micro reactors, what is being used today and what's the trade-off there if we can actually get to that future reactor? Current state of the military base is that they have backup generators. Like any, any site that has critical infrastructure, um, those backup generators will have diesel storage tanks. They'll be 40,000 to to 150,000 gallons of diesel um, on those sites. And they only, only use it in a backup scenario. So it requires they put batteries all over the installation. And uh, if there is an outage, they're typically gonna run out of that diesel. Mm -hmm. um, especially if there's you know something like the that uh, Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack where we lost an ability to move fuel in a huge multi-state area. Um, and they, they run out of fuel before their, their time frame, which is, uh, usually a 14 day resilience time frame. Um, so they've got a problem and they're looking for solutions and they're actually very interested in um, both categories of micro reactor because those are this around the scale of the base. All of the larger ones, an SMR or a 
gigawatt class uh, reactor would be too large for them. Mm -hmm. David, let's bring you into this conversation. Sure. Obviously, we've invested in Radiant, and I want to get your sense of where you see capital being deployed in this new ecosystem as new reactors are coming online. What's the opportunity here, and where do you see, again, some of those private dollars actually being deployed to? Yeah, so let me, let me I guess, back up, and, and both Doug and, and Dr. Huff talked about touched upon some really important, I think, points that relate to why having modular or just numerous points of energy generation spread across our grid and possibly amongst our allies is really an important concept because mm -hmm. I think we we touched on it, but for people that are that are not spending all their time in energy, it may not be obvious why energy and defense or in national security and, and sovereignty are really, really interrelated. Um, so I'll, I'll give it. I'll just give one example, and this is this is I, I don't, maybe not what Dr. Huff was referring to, but take take an island country like Taiwan that does not have its own energy independence. Um, you could imagine a blockade of a country like Taiwan, where um, coal, oil, or other fuel sources that are normally supposed to go deliver fuel to the island are prevented from reaching their ports. Um, at that point, a country like Taiwan may only have a week or two or three weeks of fuel on the island. And rather than having some kind of a kinetic or, or war on, on Taiwan, a blockade would just be equally potentially as devastating. Um, you can imagine hospitals running out of their generator supply, military bases uh, not, not able to turn the lights on, runways have no runway lights. I mean, it's, you know, it cascades from there. Um, and just all the infrastructure eventually just quickly starts to fall apart. And so for, for countries, that, that same example actually applies to the U.S. We do have lots of geographic things that protect us as a country. We have two major oceans on both sides. We have lots of resources. Um, we obviously have our own fuel supplies, uh, but our grid is very brittle. And one, there's multiple ways to make the grid more resilient, but one way is just adding capacity in distributed fashions so that when there are power line issues or fuel transfer issues, you're not totally reliant on these major sources of power or for fuel to power entire parts of our country. And so that that's just critically important that we increase the resiliency of our grid by adding redundancies and, and lots of power generation. And if we are able to do that by creating these more uh, modular reactors, even if they're not mobile, Mm -hmm. um, but modular reactors, we could, I, the, the, one of the issues with nuclear historically is that it costs a lot of money to build, not just time, but a lot of money. One of the reasons it costs a lot of money is we don't actually make that much of it. And if we made more of it and we sort of developed that muscle, we could make more reactors more cheaply. Right. Um, and by doing that, we could place them in strategic places across the country, make sure they're close to our key Air Force bases and military bases uh, in places where we need really reliable and enduring energy. Um, so that, that's why it's so important for national defense and for security um, and why our allies care, care about it as well. No country wants to be totally at the mercy uh, for energy of, of other countries. And so that's important. Okay. So with that, and I, did I say anything wrong there? Perfect. <laughs> okay. I think I got that right. So I heard, I heard deploy more, more, deploy more energy at more every power. scale. Yep. And, and then, you know, we didn't even talk about, we didn't even talk about data centers, but like, you know, we're going through an AI revolution right now and, you know, it's going to bring lots of cool apps to our phones and our devices and our new vision goggles or whatever, um, and all kinds of new devices we don't even have yet. Um, our cars are becoming electric and we got to charge those things up. And so all those things need power. Uh, and so we just need way more resiliency and way more capacity on the grid. Um, and again, that's going to come from lots of ways, but nuclear is a, is a really, really good way. And that's why um, I think there's this, this is like this much more palpable energy. Okay. So now to your question of the capital. Why are we investing in nuclear and where is that money going to come from? Was that part of the question? Well, yeah, I think just as we get these new reactor designs coming into this ecosystem, yep. like, is there a new play? Is there a reason why now private dollars are interested? Yeah. So, look, I, I think the national lab system, which is really a unique and special thing about America, um, other countries have things that they try to replicate the national lab system, but there's nothing quite as robust. Um, and the national lab system has many roles, and Dr. Huff can speak to this better than I, than I can, since I think she helps oversee the national lab system <laughs> uh, in her current role. Um, but they, not only do they provide research, but they're actually part of the supply chain of fuel for nuclear power plants. Um, they provide grants and funding uh, for private uh, industry to work on nuclear reactor designs. There's a competition element that the National Lab System uh, fosters and the DOE fosters. Uh, and, and so that has been all wonderful. But I think that we have noticed that there's an opportunity to be an accelerant 
to what's happening in the national lab system and what's happening in, which is closely tied to academia, to say, hey, look, maybe there's a commercial opportunity. And actually, maybe it's possible when we think about all these data centers that people want to build. And, you know, a lot of utilities are private, even if they're regulated, that they're private companies. Maybe they, we can say, hey, look, maybe there's an opportunity to really jumpstart a different kind of power industry. Uh, and that's a bet that we're willing to make. We think that there's tailwinds from a regulatory standpoint. Uh, we think there's tailwinds from an economic standpoint of building reactors. There's a talent tailwind. So Doug worked at SpaceX. When SpaceX first started, there was only one company that really reliably put things into space, and it was NASA. Uh, and now and now we have SpaceX doing it so often that it's it's, it's almost a non-event now when, when they launch uh, satellites into space and rockets into space. And we think the same thing can be true with nuclear. And it doesn't seem like the kind of uh, market where only one company can win. Uh, as Doug mentioned, there's all kinds of different approaches to nuclear for different use cases. And so that's pretty exciting. And I think that sin since our investment in Radian, what uh, I've discovered is that there's a huge amount of what I call downstream capital. So other investors who have larger pools of capital that are maybe not as risk tolerant as, as, as we are in recent Horowitz, but who want to do project financing uh, or who want to fund large scale capital projects, they have all, they're very interested. And then companies like Microsoft have spun up nuclear teams, nuclear energy teams yeah. to figure out how do they procure energy that comes from a nuclear power plant. Uh, and so that, that to me just says, look, there, there's, it's unclear exactly what the roadmap is going to look like. My two colleagues here will, will know better than I do. But there, there's just a lot of momentum and enthusiasm for something that we know is possible. There's no scientific risk. Like we're, we're, sure. with nuclear energy, that's another important thing is we invest in all kinds of things. There's no scientific risk with nuclear energy or minimal science. Like we know how it works. The, the science is understood. Yeah, we've known for a <laughs> while. We, we can come up with better designs uh, and better programs and we need new kinds of fuels, but we know how it works. It's not science fiction. Yeah. Um, it, science it's very reality. real. Yeah, it's science reality. Yeah. So that's why I'm excited about it. And that's why I think there's a lot more capital and interest in it now. And the people recognize it's a, a predicate for, for everything else we want to do. Yeah. I mean, something you mentioned several times there is the economics and even you talked about space and that whole industry being rethought due to the economics fundamentally shifting. So can we talk about that and the role of regulation in impacting some of these projects? I think a lot of people cite Vogel as a project where the economics were, you know, far out of proportion, at least relative to the original project plan. And a lot of people think, you know, that's an example of where people aren't willing to invest in nuclear. Dr. Hoff, can you just speak to maybe how regulation plays a role in enabling some of these projects and whether any of that is changing or maybe whether Vogel is an outlier? How do you think about that? Vogel, in a very real sense, is a first-of-a-kind build. It's not the first-of-a-kind, you know, as was already mentioned. You know, those <laughs> AP1000s can be built faster in different environments. But those different environments aren't different just because of regulation. They are also different because of the workforce capacity available. So, you know, you look at a Chinese build of an AP1000 and compare it to Vogel, and they had real differences in the workforce availability. And I think the, that's one of the longer poles in the tent, not to divert from your question about regulation, but I do think, you know, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission does an incredibly good job keeping nuclear reactors operating safely. They have an incredible safety record here in the United States. And the NRC makes sure that that's true. It makes it easy for me to say nuclear, nuclear power is safe. It's going to continue to be safe here in the U.S. U.S. nuclear technology is some of the safest in the world, and people should import it rather than, you know, some different technology. And you know, we know how to do it well. It can increase timelines. It can increase costs. But I think even more critical is going to be workforce and supply chain issues that can delay the deployment of mega projects. So regardless of whether you're a nuclear reactor that you're building or whether you're looking at building a bridge or a highway system or a rail line, these mega projects in the billions of dollars take years. They should sometimes take significantly more time than they should. And each day in a project like that is another day on which you are holding billions of dollars of capital and not making profit. And the cost of capital then starts to play into the total cost of the project. And so the timeline on which you can deploy a reactor depends on, yes, regulation, but also workforce availability and supply chain issues and like simple project management. Adding up all of these things, the U.S. has lost this muscle being able to do this efficiently in these big, big mega projects, whether it's an airport or a nuclear reactor. And by 
executing Vogel, we have succeeded at getting there with some reactors. I mean, the Vogel Unit 4 will turn on, you know, in a few months. Vogel Unit 3 has turned on and is providing clean power to the people of Georgia. And in the course of doing so, it has ensured this, the availability of some supply chains around nuclear. It has trained thousands of workers that are otherwise, you know, excellent skilled crafts workers and are now nuclear trained skilled crafts workers, electricians and boilermakers and uh, welders and everyone else, you know, all of the building trades and et cetera. I mean, they had peaks of, you know, staff on site, you know, around 8,000 people. It's a huge wow. number of people on site building a reactor. You know, union crafts workers from 48 states. Um, and so that is the thing that I would point to as something that I would worry about in the longer term around the profitability of, you know, reactors is that, you know, we've now shown that the AP-1000 can be built. If you were to replicate that particular reactor, you should see some learnings, right? Because now you've got a bunch of workers you can draw on. You've got some supply chains you can draw on. But so too can all the other reactor companies that are planning to build new technologies. They'll share some of the supply chain. They'll share some of the workers. And if we don't do it tomorrow, a lot of those workers will go and build wind turbines. They have other things to do. This is a really tight environment um, to have you know, enough skill set for the kinds of builds we need to do across the energy space, not just yeah. nuclear. So is that what you would point to? It's not so much the regulation, but ensuring that we have that workforce. Yeah. Is there anything you would do or say that we can do to improve that outlook? Yeah, I think, you know, a, a focus on trade schools instead of merely universities. You know, I say this as a former and future university professor. It is absolutely important that trade schools and community colleges and, you know, union training programs all be stood up at the capacity we need for nuclear builds, wind turbine build outs, you know, solar panel build outs, the kinds of transmission build outs we're going to need. Um, and regulation certainly can get faster, but I would focus instead of lowering the barriers and accelerating the process. Mm -hmm. so. Doug, obviously you're building in this space. How do you think about those relationships, whether it's with regulators or with the large workforces that are needed in some of these cases? How do you think of those relationships becoming productive? I have so much I want to unpack. <laughs> uh, so I think what Dr. Huff was talking about, um, I want to connect a little further. So a really, really big plant that was built like that is amazing. It's awesome. And all that workforce that we trained. And I think that can apply across this entire spectrum of the different reactor sizes, that any successful project should be cross pollinating that other project. And it's not just from regulatory sense, but from just gaining that experience, that learning by doing and getting the cost to be lower. So I'm excited to be part of that way down at the tiny end of the spectrum where we're, our reactors are 1000 times smaller. But the, the regulatory environment uh, does need to change. And I think we were already working on it. There are a bunch of NRC modernization efforts um, coming by direction through Congress. Um, we've been working on developing things like 10 CFR 53, and that will be an ongoing and continuing effort. But I think for it to really succeed, we need reactors to get built, to get fueled, to demonstrate, and the DOE to a large degree are already fully supporting that. Mm -hmm. um, and just for the audience, can you break down what some of those changes are that um, you just referenced? Well, I think some of the changes are, are really just broad, broad spectrum. We don't have reactors that are this small that can be built in a factory. To just, I'm just going to talk about uh, portable micro reactors mm -hmm. only. Um, you know, for us to succeed at doing that, our timeline has not changed since we started the company in 2020. We want to do a fuel demonstration in 2026. Um, we're, we're going to go through DOE authorization licensing, this path that exists at the national labs to go faster than normal. Um, to do a test reactor at a test facility where you've got all the national lab support, the expertise, the poster radiation experiment labs. Um, we're going to do that with our first unit. Uh, our second unit, though, needs to go through NRC licensing. And so we've got to staff up in our, uh, our little 45-person company uh, these parallel paths to support going along both sets of regulations. And I think mm -hmm. the, the two could be actually woven together in a really practical manner. And I know that People have thought about this for a while, but we just haven't achieved it. So, so that's one of the things we could do. Um, but we've never cited a factory to mass produce reactors. Um, what's funny about that is the regulations actually exist. <laughs> if you go look at like the original codes, 10 CFR 50 has a thing called a manufacturing license. It's in there and unused. But I think um, if we were willing so to... How many, how many manufacturing licenses are there? There's zero. Zero? There's zero. It's never been used. Well, 
in the U.S. This is just U.S. Yeah, for a codes. reactor factory. There, there, there exists no such Sounds thing. Sounds like a good idea, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is factory. the only way a yeah. microreactor is going to get to the economics, right? As if it's built more like airplanes. Than like airplanes, an assembly right? line. Absolutely. Yeah. So we've been looking at that code, learning about it, figuring out what our questions are, talking with the NRC. Um, actually, our uh, Kaleidos microreactor is now officially in pre-application, um, only very recently. Uh, we're on the NRC's website. They're planning for uh, us in their budget so we can get that uh, sorted out on time. Um, so we'll be uh, citing a reactor very quickly. We want to deploy a unit in 2028. We're going to, to build our unit with as much support as we can gather. We're not going to uh, change our timeline. Um, and we started to feel real support from the DOE. I just I want to say thanks uh, for the support we have. At, uh, we're working with Idaho National Laboratory. Um, Reagan is committed to it being ready in 2026 uh, to go into the, the dome. There's an old uh, experimental breeder reactor dome that was converted to now do these micro reactor demonstration experiments. And a lot of work and effort and funds have gone to build that structure. And uh, we're still on target and ready to go use it uh, as soon as it's available. It's so exciting, actually, this feed study that Radiant is doing. You know, they're in the first set of three companies that are going to sort of sh tell us exactly what they would do inside this former containment structure that housed one of the coolest reactors we've ever built out there in the in Idaho. That reactor's over. And now there's room for new reactors to try things out uh, in a safe sandbox. Yeah. yeah. And I know we're early stages, but this picture of an assembly line of reactors is one that, you know, a few years ago might have sounded outlandish, but now there are builders creating this. Where will we be, like, let's say in a decade, if this does come online? Can you just paint a picture, Doug, of, you know, where these reactors could be deployed and how maybe broadly they might be deployed and the use cases for them? Yeah, absolutely. So, We'll start the 10 years in, in 2026. So ideally, we fuel and demonstrate at full power in the dome. Uh, and then in, by 2028, we have one commercial unit just a few years later. To do that, we're, we're really running two regulatory efforts in parallel. Um, and then three units in 2029, eight units in 2030, scaling on up until we're at 2036, we should be making 50 units a year. A reactor a week coming off a line. Um, and the reactor we're developing, it's a heavy unit, but it can fit in a C-17 aircraft or on a truck, and you can move it around, get it wherever it needs to go in the world. Um, the optimal use case is really replacing some diesel generators in some remote region. And then a reactor lasts for five years, approximately out in the field, and then is shut down, and then we bring it back to that factory to refuel it. So it is not only a new reactor construction factory, um, but a line producing a bunch of new cores and a refueling facility all co-located on the same you know, 25 acre or so plot of land. And, and so what we would do is have a population of about a thousand of these out in the world because we're planning for a 20 year licensing time frame. So you've got the 50 a year and the, about 20 years they last. And so there's kind of a thousand of them that we can go and put in the thousand most important places that there are. So these are like North Slope in Alaska, these really remote communities that uh, the ocean freezes up for them and they have to store huge amounts of diesel and they can't get new over the winter, so you've got to plan ahead and have enough. Um, and even when they can get new, <laughs> the price variability yeah. is incredibly unjust. Unjust. Give us a sense of that. Like how much can price they can vary? can fluctuate by an order of magnitude, and you can't plan ahead for your family's budget if you if you have to be planning ahead for diesel power that changes on the day to day time frame mm -hmm. on the market, especially in a geopolitical situation. Let, like letting a town lease yeah. a reactor for twenty years is very doable. Yeah. And it just dawned on me, as Sorry. all of you were saying that, no, that Thanks. you might imagine that people in the public might think, oh, I don't want a reactor in my backyard. But at the same time, in, in this scenario, you could imagine that this Alaskan town would beg for that, right? Yeah. We don't want this variance. We actually, like, please give us this reactor now. I think a lot of people would want a reactor near them. Maybe not yes. in their literal backyard, yeah. but I think that's mostly <laughs> because they'd rather have a pool. Right. Um, not for any safety-related reason, mm -hmm. uh, but I think they want one near a them. heated pool. And I think that if you're in a natural disaster area and you're hoping that FEMA is going to come in and they might come in and provide you some tents and shelters, but it's very hard to provide power in a real serious natural disaster, whether it's wildfires, whether it's hurricanes. Uh, and the two things you need immediately after disaster are clean water and you need power. And you can't do clean water from a generator. Too, it takes way too much fuel. But you can do clean water from a reactor. 
Uh, you can hook up a reactor to something that will clean water very easily and provide people with the water they need to survive and with energy. And that, to me, the fact that you can bring that in on an 18-wheeler is just supremely powerful. Uh, and there's nothing like that today that exists in the world. And the number of lives that it could change is tremendous. So separate from all the defense-related, national security-related things, that's just an, one more example of many um, of where having the ability to quickly truck in or fly in reliable and enduring power is the idea that we will, to me, you asked 10 years where we're going to be. 10 or 15 years from now, the idea that we can't just immediately turn on a reliable and enduring power source for a community is going to be like, it's going to be unimaginable. It's like, it just, it will be a solved problem. I want to add one thing to that. Um, you know, not only is it a mass produced reactor you can truck in, but you can truck out. So yep. this use in FEMA right, uh, for temporary use uh, is perfectly what the Kaleidos micro reactor is designed to do. Uh, reactors don't carry themselves away and everything that was radioactive can be fully removed just on a normal truck mm -hmm. um, and you leave a green field the day you leave. Um, that's never been seen before in nuclear. I don't think, um, I wanted to share that point. Um, yeah. yeah, you can take it and move it somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. a brilliant application. I mean, like people see these United <laughs> Rentals trucks around that like when you go to a concert, there's like, you know, the big United Rentals thing that's got this big generator <laughs> and it's like, it makes all the noise. Yeah. Uh, it's like, look, look, we can just have United Rental reactors. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, why that, not? That's actually what we ran um, when we did the Hyperloop project at SpaceX. I was in charge of all the electrical work for it. We rented a big diesel Jensa and that ran this futuristic tube that we pumped down to vacuum and, and ran vehicles up to 350 miles an hour in. But mm -hmm. it could be at every could be reactor. Use. I want to connect one other thing too. Yes. We talked about this Alaskan town. There's one more thing that really motivates me uh, about what we're doing. In a lot of places, they use diesel generators only for prime power. Um, the health implications of that are dramatic, right? A diesel genset operating, of course, will produce uh, CO2. But more critically, more importantly, it's producing carcinogens, fumes that people are breathing in that area. They're breathing carcinogens. Um, and if you look at um, what happens in a town over 20 years of span. Um, if you pick a diesel gen set instead of a reactor, um, there's something like 12 uh, deaths that are going to occur prematurely from the use of diesel. Normal, natural measure, just, just at a rate, ending people's lives prematurely. So that's one of the things that really motivates me. Um, and on the regulatory side, uh, I think we've got to think about that case. I think we've got to make it possible at some point in the future for that, the people, the decision makers in that, that town, this theoretical little town, to be able to pick the nuclear reactor, the clean technology that's going to save lives and to have an equal bar for regulations so that they can pick it. Because one of the barriers right now will be the regulations for nuclear are very challenging to cite these little reactors. And it's because they don't exist and we haven't planned for it yet. But that's uh, what I think we need to start working on now so that 10 years from now, that future is achievable. Mm -hmm. And when we think about these communities, just so we can attack this question head on, Dr. Huff, can you just speak to waste, right? That's something that comes up a lot from these reactors, old reactors. Do we have a way currently today to safely store nuclear waste from these reactors? Yes. This is a technically solved problem. Right now, all the spent fuel is stored safely where it is. It's a solid it's not a glowing green goo. It's <laughs> a Simpsons. ceramic. It's more like yeah. a teacup, right? Yeah. Um, now, defense waste is a distinct thing, but the commercial nuclear fuel in this country has never caused any, you know, radiation harm to humans. It is stored safely in either pools or um, in dry cast storage. It is, however, at 70 locations across the country in places where the Department of Energy promised to take it off of their hands. They didn't intend to store it there for the long term. And while it is safe, for the long term as it currently stands, it is the Department of Energy's responsibility to take it and consolidate it into a, you know, one or more consolidated interim storage sites to reduce the number of communities that live near those uh, facilities that they didn't agree to in the long term. And so we're working through a consent-based process to identify locations that would be amenable to this um, it's a really exciting process that worked really successfully in uh, 
Finland to site a whole final repository and is working in Canada. They're down to two sites uh, for their final repository, which is much more complicated than an interim storage facility. Mm. Um, so it's our responsibility to do. We're doing it. There's no technical question about, you know, is it possible to safely store spent nuclear fuel? We do it every day. We've continued to do it. We transport spent nuclear safe, fuel safely across the United States successfully. No problem. Just to expand a little bit to going back to this sort of what does the future look like 10, 20, 30 years from now, right? In addition to microreactors saving the world at that sort of edge of, you know, accessibility to power at the edge of, you know, um, viability of other options, right where diesel generators might sit at the edge of that small size scale. We also see real opportunities to directly replace one for one coal facilities, right? Mm -hmm. Unabated fossil facilities across the country represent a real opportunity for those 100, 200, 300 megawatt units, even bigger. And they should be a real boon to the communities in them. Because interestingly, the radiation exposure from living next to a coal plant is higher than the radiation exposure from living next to a nuclear power plant. We can reduce the radiation. Amazing. Yeah, Incredible. because, you know, we, we really, you know, there's no emissions from nuclear power and the emissions from unabated fossils actually can mm -hmm. really um, include a lot of heavy metals and whatnot. I, we're in this place where, you know, I think... It's it's really important that communities, especially communities around retiring and retired coal sites, can have better health outcomes. Just like what Doug was saying about microreactors and diesel, the same can be said about small modular reactors and and you know larger scale fossil plants. And that motivates me too. When we think about the two hundred to three hundred thousand premature deaths every year caused by pollution, unnecessary pollution, most of which is from power generation. We can save those people. Yeah. So it needs to be addressed at every scale. It yeah. turns out that burning trace radioactive materials and releasing them in these other energy forms is much less safe than nuclear waste, which is kept in containers and shipped and moved safely. Yeah. And has caused no accidents. Exactly. Absolutely. Well, maybe to come full circle, Dr. Huff, in your recent testimony, you mentioned that recently at COP28, the U.S. and 24 other countries signed an agreement to triple nuclear power by 2050. That's very exciting, but it also sounds quite lofty. And so what do you really think needs to be in place? We touched on some of these things, whether it's regulation, the workforce, et cetera, public opinion. A lot of these are shifting in terms of tides as well, I should say. So What's your take on how we actually achieve that goal and reverse this multi-year trend? Yeah, let me be clear. You know, these 24 countries signed together to say we recognize that we need to get to tripling nuclear power. We didn't say we knew it would be possible. You know, I think the agreement here is that we recognize that there's a gap that has to be filled by clean firm power. And that gap is gigantic. And a huge fraction of that gigantic gap must be filled by nuclear power or else we're never going to get to net zero. And so this agreement is that, you know, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IEA, the IAEA, et cetera, have all done a bunch of studies. We, our individual countries, have done studies about what it's going to take to get to net zero. And it's going to take tripling nuclear power. How do we get there? Um, we are going to have to build new nuclear power at a rate unparalleled. Now, not so crazy dissimilar from the rates of gigawatts we added in the 70s and 80s. If we don't start tomorrow building reactors, then the rate goes up. So importantly, if we don't build any new reactors next year, then we're going to have to build slightly more every year between now and 2050. So the slower we are at startup, the harder it's going to be to build out a supply chain appropriate for building the number of reactors we have to build. Um, you know, if you wait until the last minute to do all your homework, you have to write a whole essay in one hour. But <laughs> if you spend the week ahead of time, then you only have to write a few words a day. And that's the situation we're in. We have a little time, but we have to start tomorrow. We cannot wait until the last minute. I think, I think there's a couple of points you brought up that <clears throat> I think about a lot. Um, one, you mentioned the supply chain for nuclear energy. Uh, we need to be the source of fuel. Right now, uh, America is a source of nuclear fuel, um, but there are other countries that make a lot of nuclear fuel. And I think, you know, I, I think about our American dynamism practices, investing in companies that support the national interest. One of the things that I think is in the national interest is to be the premier source for nuclear fuel for not just the U.S., but also our allies. Um, and that's something we can do and we certainly, certainly could do, um, much like I think storing nuclear, spent nuclear fuel um, or recycling nuclear fuel. Some people have this 
there's atmospherics around it. It's like PR atmospherics. And people are like, oh, I don't know if I want that. They, they, they ignore about all these other things they have in their backyard. And they, they were like, oh, but that sounds bad because I saw a commercial once where I saw The Simpsons. Exactly. Um, and they don't want the fish with three eyes, which is not a real thing. Um, and, and so I think we have an opportunity to really invest in the supply chain for nuclear resources and nuclear fuel. Um, and I think it'd be really cool to see something kind of like the CHIPS Act for nuclear. First of all, I think it would be a very bipartisan thing in, the, in this country. Um, I also think it's something where we could really encourage investment abroad. There are a lot of countries that would love to be having more, that would like to have more nuclear energy, as, as Dr. Huff uh, said. And I think we have an obligation to be a leader there. Um, there are things called one, two, three agreements that I believe the State Department oversees today that sort of regulates the amount of nuclear information and nuclear sort of business that we can transact with certain countries. Um, but it's still an onerous agreement and it's still, there's different standards to that agreement. Um, and there, there could be a real national priority put on elevating those standards or making them more accessible or disseminating, disseminating them more widely. Uh, while still maintaining, and especially if we're the source of nuclear fuel for these countries, it still gives us the levers of control that we want to enable countries to have more nuclear power, but in a way that we think is safe and reliable and, um, you know, re represents the interests of our, of our country. I, I do think there's some regulatory improvement that, that is gaining momentum here and we want to see more of. I also think there can be a much larger international focus on, Amer you know, America exports all kinds of technology. We export defense products. We export all kinds of things. And there's no reason why we shouldn't be exporting more um, nuclear uh, reactors. And we, and we do, like AP-1000, but we, we could be doing much more. Um, and that to me is exciting, an exciting opportunity, at least when you think about the commercial aspects, that it's not just the U.S. that has this insatiable need for energy, but it is a, it is a global opportunity. Absolutely. And if we don't do it, I think that other countries will. Yep. I guess that's the, that's the flip side of it is if we, like, you know, right now, um, for instance, there's a country that, that, uh, very much would like nuclear reactors for energy. Um, and the U S is not allowed to sell into that country. And currently the only other country bidding on a reactor is China. Um, and I just think it'd be better if we could bid in that country also. So. Absolutely. Doug, anything you'd add there in terms of, you could say a wish list you're building in this space. And there are so many different factors that come together, what do you hope to see, whether it's the supply chain, the workforces, the regulation that we've talked a lot about? Uh, I'm thinking, we talk very long term, I'm thinking much more short term about my wish list because I have a very tight schedule. Um, operating the dome is just two years away, 23 months. Um, uh, I need to make sure I get access to fuel. Um, something David mentioned, it's really challenging and Outdrop has been helping. We talk about this regularly, and I appreciate it. <laughs> it's um, but it's still a challenge for us. Uh, I think a, a real microreactor demonstration program from the federal side would probably be the single biggest thing we could do to accelerate our efforts to commercialization. Um, and I think that would help cross-pollinate every other project that we have going on. Dr. Huff, I'm going to close with you. Anything else you'd like to share with the folks in the room, but also we have so many people listening who may have varying degrees of education on nuclear, the state of it in our country. What would you like to leave people with about the years ahead? Yeah, I think there's an incredible amount of money to be made. There are lives to be saved. There is democracy to preserve, sovereignty to deploy abroad. And we have unquestionably some of the best technology in the world it's American design. It's an American invention. Uh, we are the first nation to ever, you know, sustain a fission chain reaction on purpose. We have the largest nuclear fleet in the world. We are poised to lead this as we transition into a cleaner energy system. But we have to see private industry step up and say, I will be the first to sign a contract to build the next radiant or whatever. And I want to see as many contracts on the books as possible in the next couple of years, or else we are going to have a much bigger supply chain challenge in the next 20 years than we have today. Every few months that are delayed between now and the order books that we need to show that deployment, the harder it's going to be to build out as much as we need to get to net zero. We have to get to net zero, full stop. Not only have we promised the world, we're leading the world 
And I intend to still be around in 2050, and I'd like to be able to breathe. Here, here. Here, here. That's Very a great well place said. to end off. Thank and we, th- you so we much. thank Dr. Huff, I think, for her efforts in, Absolutely. And, uh, in DOE yeah. and really pushing forward, I would say, a renewed and uh, re energized uh, attitude towards nuclear policy. It's, you know, innovators like Radiant and others that are really leading the way and give us some good work to work with. Well, I mean, I think that's why we brought all three of you in, right? We have all sides of the equation. We have the funders, the builders, and the policymakers um, all in the room because that's all required for the future. Now, if you have made it this far, don't forget that you can get an inside look into A16Z's American Dynamism Summit at a16z.com slash summit. There, you can catch several of the exclusive stage talks featuring policymakers like Deputy Secretary of Defense Kathleen Hicks or Governor Westmore of Maryland, plus both founders from companies like Anduril and Coinbase and funders like Mark Cuban, all building toward American dynamism. Again, you can find all of the above at a16z.com slash summit and we'll include a link in the show notes.